bum 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 You are now in session with the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. I'm Lisa Gullickson. I'm Brad Gullickson. And each month we evaluate a different iconic romance within the four color realm. In this episode, we are crossing the threshold into the Crooked House. And the Power Rangers were there, <laughs> and Neo was there, and Yoda, and Ripley, and they kindly transported us to our creator corner, where we are talking to editor and publisher Mark Wade about the history of science fiction, a graphic novel adventure by Xavier Dolo and Jabril Morissette fan from Humanoids. What? Mark Wade has joined comic book couples counseling? How is that possible? It can't be because we are super cool, because we are not. We are definitely not cool, but he has somehow deemed us worthy enough to join us to chat about the history of science fiction. Look, this was not originally the plan, uh, but guess what? You know this. We're terrible at scheduling. <laughs> We're very busy. And we had so many opportunities come up this past week. If you've gone over to the comicbookcouplescounseling.com, you have noticed that we also chatted with Jeffrey Brown about Batman and Robin and Howard. Which is adorable, and by the way. We have guested on 10 Cent Takes to talk about Deathmate, which is an episode that will drop on Thanksgiving and will tie in with our couple that's going to follow Green Arrow and Black Canary. Yes, we are still going to conclude <laughs> our Green Arrow and Black Canary series. That is happening, but we just couldn't let these opportunities slide. Especially when it involves reading all of Death Mate. <laughs> Especially when it involves reading all of Death Mate. Oh my God. But... We got a lot out of it, and we had a lot to say on 10 Cent Takes, and I'm excited for that conversation to get out there in the world. Me too. But in the meantime, this is a delicious morsel, a conversation between CBCC and Mark Wade. Yeah, I mean, this is nuts. We actually chatted with Mark on the day that Humanoids announced that Taika Waititi would be writing and directing an adaptation of the Incal. So, of course, we had to, like talk to him a little bit about that, ask him a question or two. But uh, if if that's what you're excited to hear from Mark Wade in this conversation, you're going to be disappointed because guess what? He doesn't have all the details about the Incal, which is far from filming at this point. Uh, but, you know, or if he does have the details. Why would he tell us? He's not telling us. <laughs> so we do talk about the Incal a little bit. And we talk about Yodorovsky and Mobius and how gorgeous and crazy that comic is and how it represents so much to so many people. And when you think about humanoids as a publisher, you think about the Incal first, probably. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we dance around that a little bit. But mostly this conversation is about this new graphic novel that they're putting out, The History of Science Fiction, which is a really unique item. This book that he is promoting, The History of Science Fiction, is so much more than an illustrated yeah. history of science fiction. Yeah. It's got pictographs, it's got a narrative, it's got metaphor. I think sometimes when you hear about projects like this, like graphic novel histories of basketball or graphic novel histories of science, uh, they can be a little stale. And this is absolutely not that. So, And, and it's also not for kids. Like, it no. is for kids, but, like, they recommend sex criminals in here. Right. <laughs> so it's not exclusively for children. Yeah, and like, like, so when they're talking the history of science fiction, I mean, they're talking the history of science fiction. It is both exhaustive and entertaining somehow. Yeah. It's a feat is well, what it is. I think it's entertaining because of how Dolo and Fan start the comic with these two robots that 
Well, I was going to say we both know, but like, okay, so we see Robbie the robot. He's inside an X-Wing, and then he's with this other tuxedo robot. They call Jenkins. Which they call Jenkins, and we think is from the Clifford Simak novel, City, but don't quote us on that. Because we just Googled it. Right, and right, so right. that was the best we could do with a quick Goog. So they're flying around what looks like the plains of America inside an X-Wing, and they land outside something called the Crooked House, and then they enter. And in the Crooked House are all of your favorite sci-fi icons. So Captain Kirk is in there. Uh, Akira. Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica. Like, like too many to name right now. Just like all, like, and not even all of them, but a lot of them. So the metaphor is that everybody who has, every character in science fiction is part of this enormous family and this book is acting of something of like, like a like a reunion. Right, right. And originally this book was published overseas and Mark Wade helped bring it to America and they did some like tinkering and we talk about that in the conversation and they update it. Uh, and, and, and of course, like, you know. We, we, didn't, we didn't talk. We talk a little bit again with this with Mark Wade, but like Mark Wade is also in the book. Like Kingdom Come gets <laughs> mentioned. You know, when you're talking the great science fiction and superhero comics, you got to throw some love to Kingdom Come. The great thing about talking to Mark Wade, who is an amazing writer, Justice League, Black Widow, Daredevil. Yes. But when we're talking to him as an editor and publisher, we really can get the nitty gritty of what what his ideal comic is. Right. We get to have a way more general conversation. Yeah, this is a very unique conversation. It's not like a lot of creator corners. It's probably closest in relation to the chat that we had last week with Douglas Woke mm, about yes. all of the Marvels, because these are two fans, two uh, creative individuals who are throwing themselves into their own fandom. From our conversation, what I learned about Mark Wade is that he is a creator who is who just wants to see what he wants to read, what he wants to experience in the world. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't exist, he writes it. If he finds it somewhere or somebody who can create that thing, he publishes it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't want to spoil it here, but we ask him, like, why is he excited about the history of science fiction at Humanoids as a publisher? And his answer surprised me and also, like, just thrilled me. What I think makes this conversation with Mark Wade so exciting is that we're not just talking about his process. We don't mm -hmm. want to be Mark Wade when we grow up. Maybe we I mean, kind of I do. Mean, I do. <laughs> but um, we get to talk to him about science fiction and why he finds it so exciting and why he wants to promote it in this unique way. Yeah, we get to nerd out with him. And I think I would like to see more conversations like this one in the online world. You know, so many interviews, including the ones that we do, are about, like you say, process, process and about the, the subject that we're speaking to. But here's an opportunity to just hang out with Mark Wade and chat comics, to chat the Incal to chat science fiction. To and chat Superman. To chat Superman. By the way, we recorded this on Zoom and right behind him, you know, he let us know that he was the world's biggest Superman fan because he had this great painting right at his back uh, that he refers to at one point in this chat. And uh, it's just, it's so good to see. Like his enthusiasm is infectious. And yeah, I just, I'm so I'm so happy. Of course, behind our shoulder was a poster of ourselves. <laughs> So. I did think about that, Lisa. <laughs> but what a great Karen Charm comic book couples counseling poster that is, right? That's right. That's right. So, yeah, I think that's all we need to do to set this chat up. I'm literally withholding my enthusiasm so I have something to say in the outro. <laughs> yes, if we don't stop now, we will just continue gushing forever, which sounds disgusting. I'm so sorry to put that image in your head. <laughs> Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on to Comic Book Couples Counseling to chat with us today. Super appreciate it. Very excited. My pleasure. Uh, it's a crazy day to talk to you. Uh, I just got the tweet from Humanoids about the Incal. That's nuts. Yeah. Congrats. Thanks. That's just, for those who don't know, we announced that Taika Waititi will be doing uh, 
directing and co-writing an adaptation of The Ink Owl. Unfilmable graphic novel, some might have said, although that was never me. I always thought it would make a hell of a great movie. Yeah. And just what's your excitement level and around that project? And what's the significance of The Ink Owl finally going before cameras? It is so overdue. I mean, it is so overdue. It's the best-selling science fiction graphic novel in the world. And it is an amazing story by Mobius and Jodorowsky. And, you know, it's been kicking around Hollywood forever. People trying to find a way to crack that code because it's incredibly visual as a graphic novel, but it's a different medium. I mean, it's and, and you have to make choices and, and so forth if you're going to move from one medium to the other. And nobody's been able to crack that code yet, but Taika has. Mm. And so we're really excited here. Uh when I think humanoids, I think the book I think first is the Incal. And yeah. so my excitement around the idea of this movie getting out there and mainstream audiences uh, absorbing it is that it will drive more people to humanoids. That's what we're hoping. And meanwhile, we're just popping champagne around the office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, well, you know, we're here to talk about this new graphic history of science fiction, yeah. uh, which the Incal certainly plays a large portion within the tapestry of science fiction. And it's um, certainly within the book, yes. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And and I guess where I would like to get your point of view on is, you know, why why are you so excited about this project? Because clearly you are, based on what I've read already. I, mean, I really am. I mean, I think that, you know, if I if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, this is my crown jewel as a publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, when it came to us, it was originally published in, in France by our Paris division. Uh, and just flipping through it, without being able to read the text, I could tell you've got something here that is not just a graphic novel, not just illustrated text, sort of a mix of both, but also incredibly, incredibly uh, intensive, incredibly in depth. And so had it translated my, you know, any, any lingering fears I had were, you know, dissipated. And uh, we actually had the author, uh, Xavier Dolo and the artist, Jajibro Morissette fan come in and do a few extra pages to, you know, sort of, you know, because again, it was written very much from a, a Francophile point of view back then. So, so to add some more from the uh, the American point of view, but holy smokes, this thing! It's it's you know, it's two hundred pages, and they're you know, they're easy to. I, I don't when I say they're dense, I don't mean visually dense so much as just there's a lot of information there. The the index alone is mm -hmm. five pages in type that is almost too small for me to read. And we cover everything from, you know, Homer to Rebecca Roanhorse and like everything in between. And it's it's an amazing this thing is going to be a reference work for the ages. I love that the book starts with the metaphor of the crooked house. Yeah. And it's a place where all great science fiction characters live together as these kind of quirky, curious siblings and and there's like this idea of like genre having a home and yeah. there being merit to tr like just tracing the lineage of ideas and i would just like to hear you speak on this metaphor a little bit more of the idea of genre having a heart a home base somewhere right i mean it, it's it didn't for the longest time it had it but it was in what um, you know, it was a trash medium to most people when it first began in the 19 when it was first when the terms were first coined in the 1920s and 1930s, and it really began to shape. Um, and by the way, I was I was good friends with Julia Schwartz, who was mm -hmm. Ray Bradbury's first agent, and uh, and Lovecraft's last, which I which I also love. Um, and Julie was there at the very beginning of science fiction fandom. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I had many talks with him about how all that began in the, 20, in the 20s and 30s. And watching, you know, the book, as you say, sort of give context to not just the individual works, but the genre in, in general and how it has progressed over the years to be less, you know, to be regarded not as sort of a, a childish garbage medium, but actually as a, as a genre that has respect. Um, 
like I, the book starts with a forward by Ted Chiang, who talks about um, the idea, idea of genre being not like a signifier of merit or quality, but rather like this ongoing conversation. Cause I yeah. feel like cult- culturally over the course of my life, um, like there, there are like genres that have been considered schlock now being elevated to yeah. like high status. And the result has been like kind of this culture confusion of like, well, this piece of science fiction or this comic book is high status, but these are still, <laughs> these right. ones are still trash. And, right. um, and, and I'm just wondering, do you still believe in the idea of high and low art? And is, is the, do those ideas kind of live outside of genre? That's a great question. I should do more podcasts with you people. Um, <laughs> I, the, my definition of art and my definition of, of what makes good art, whether or not it's high or low is, does it accomplish what it set out to accomplish? Hmm. And in that sense, that to me is more important as a signifier than whether or not it's, it's considered high art or low art. Although, yeah, I mean, as somebody who's read 10,000 comic books, many of them complete crap. <laughs> yeah, there's there's high art and low art, but no, you know, very few people set out unless you're William Castle, or you know, to set out to create low art. Mm. Um I uh, I'm kind of babbling at the question because it's a good question. I'm not sure I'm answering it completely. Uh, you totally are. Uh, so, you know, from I, I, what the, the, what got in my head as I was starting the graphic novel was it starts from this place going into the house, the crooked house. And yeah. we see where we are right now with science fiction and how pervasive it is. And right. it starts with cinema and, you know, like the matrix and neon Genesis Evangelion. And then it goes to television and then, and then it goes backwards and then goes to Mary Shelley. Right. And I wonder what this book would be like if it had been created 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because it doesn't come think, from a defensive place at all. No, but I think where it comes from, and again, uh, this is where your partner alluded to it very well, is that it, it comes from the idea, and so, did, and so did Ted in his introduction, that it is, the genre is not, is, is, not, is not simply the work itself, but it also helps define the community around it. Mm-hmm. that and the book itself reflects that really well too because again we've got you know imagined conversations at great length between isaac asimov and heinlein and you know the greats of science fiction uh, you, as as sort of interstitials between some of the more text heavy stuff and again that that again underscores the idea that it is it's community it's a it's a way for people to find each other those of us who you know, were geeks growing up who were, you know, had to hide our comic books from the pretty girls, you know, <laughs> um, don't have to do that anymore. And it's great that we've got that. The, the, the nerds want, the Amen. nerds want, we want. Yeah. Well, what do you feel? Cause this isn't a comic book about a comic book. This is a comic book about comic books. This is a comic book about science fiction as a greater genre. Like what is right. the advantage of telling the science fiction story in this format? Another great question. I think that what comics does incredibly well is it allows you to convey a lot of information in a more abbreviated form. Uh, it, it's an old cliche, but it's still true. A picture, you know, is worth a thousand words. And so being able to do this in a visual way uh, it could very easily be a very dry recitation mm-hmm. of facts. And frankly, it's not as much fun to read about a conver- an imagined conversation between, you know, Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury as it is to see one play out on the page. And so it's, I think that the artist and the writer took incredible advantage of what comics can do and, and played into the medium, which is important to me because that's one of the questions I always ask as a publisher at Humanoids when things come across my desk is, or pitches come across my desk is why is this a comic? Why is this need to be a comic? Because the best works of any kind, I think 
are specific to their genre uh, or their medium rather. And, you know, the, the, the best television show is not necessarily going to make the best comic book. The best movie is not necessarily going to make the best stage play. Um, I think, you know, if you're an artist, you create your, your work and you find the medium that best conveys it. And in this case, I think comics was absolutely the way to go. Yeah, it's a conversation that Lisa and I have been having a lot lately, uh, you know, with so many adaptations coming around, uh, you know, like why the last man was the one we watched recently. And you go like, oh, why am I watching this and not just reading the comic book? What am I losing right. in making it live action? And or like when exchanging, I, or, or exchanging, exchanging, or exchanging, or exchanging, or, or gaining. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I look at, you know, the possibilities of the Incal, like how do you maintain Mobius in a live action adaptation? The challenge of that. Right. Uh, is, yeah, the visuals of that will, will be amazing. But the beauty of that is that when you and I've, I've seen this happen, I mean, when you bring actors into the mix of a, of a comic book, what it was a comic book and now is an adaptation, there's just so much more character you can get across. There's only so much you can do with drawings and written dialogue when you have a voice behind that and a face behind that and an emotive actor who's good then it, it transforms it into something else. Mm, yeah. yeah. And then, then I think about uh, the history of science fiction and how you could film this. You could take this graphic novel and film it and have actors play Arthur C. Clarke and Mary Shelley. But when right. you, there's no uncanny valley in the graphic novel format. They're just right. there. And I right. think that's really the beauty of this. Yes. That's a, that's well, well put. Yes. Um. Oh. What do you like when the reader puts down their copy of of this book about science fiction? And it is. And like you said, it's super dense. um, Mm -hmm. Lots of reading suggestions. Like, what is the next thing you want the person who read this book to be inspired to do? I think the first thing I want them to be inspired to do is really absorb the contextual information because that's again it's not as you've said and as i've said it's not just a a series of facts in a in a completely linear order it is instead here's you know it's all of those things but it's put in the context of okay let's look at that through the lens of inclusivity let's look at that through the lens of you know the times of the 1930s or whatever and so the first thing i want people to do is really sort of absorb the fact that you've been given a much bigger world in front of you than you, than you've just gotten from reading a few science fiction novels beyond that. I mean, we chose, I say we, I mean, Xavier with a lot of other, you know, input, um, from the editor, the, the American editor, Jonathan, uh, put a lot of thought into the sidebar material of, okay, here's some other stuff you might enjoy reading. If you, if you do, or here's some movies you might enjoy seeing. And, I really want people to deep dive into that because those were very heavily and very carefully curated choices. Yeah. I I mean, for me, what I get out of a book like this is discovery. And obviously there's moments where it's like, Oh, they feel like high fives. Like, Oh, I recognize this reference. I know this world already. I know the creation uh, of 2001 and things like that, but it's, it's the things that I don't know because the genre is so vast and it goes back so long that you come away from this and you go to that index and you do want to hit up your local comic book shop or book publisher and find those things. I did. I certainly did. Can you talk about as a creator yourself, what discovery still means for you now? It's, it's crucial. I mean, it's, it's everything because if you're not continually I mean, I spend my, honestly, the first thing I do every morning is not just hit the news, but also science news. What's going on in science? What's going on in, in, you know, in, in philosophy, what's going on. I'm trying to, to, and I'm a fact fiend in that sense. I'm always, my girlfriend continually points out, I'm constantly reading Mm -hmm. and not just not less than so, so much, not so much fiction as I am just, uh, you know, learning and absorbing about the world around me because that's how you stay relevant. That's how you stay contemporary. If you don't do that and then you run the risk of sinking into a set form of ideas, you know, you're not looking outside your world. You're in, you've created a bubble. 
And then before long, you're going to be uh, passe. Mm. What are some of the new frontiers of comic books or the science fiction genre where you'd like to see humanoids go? Like what's, what is still needs to be explored? That's a great question. Um, without sounding self-serving, I mean, I think we're, we're very invested in that very angle that we've always been very progressive and we've always been very trans- transgressive about the material and join it. Another question I always ask is why does this need to be a humanoids book? And is the, what is the transgressive element here? What is the thing that is not being told or said or spoken about from other publishers? Um, and I think we could, you know, as everybody could, we could certainly do better with exploring diversity. We could certainly, I mean, not just with the creators that we hire, but, there's there's one project that for here's the reason there's one project that came to us that uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether we're going to do yet but what I loved about it was that it in in the telling of the story it was an examination of toxic masculinity and exactly how it infects young white men and why and it did it in a way that was in no way um, you know excusing or or defending that process, but at the same time, did a real deep dive into why this happens. And that's the kind of area that I love being in. Mm-hmm. So, so you say transgression, like, mm-hmm. w- can you talk a little bit more about what you're transgressing against and, sure. and how that inspires and fuels your creativity? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, in the humanoids was created in the 1970s. And so for the 1970s, 1980s, you know, frankly, transgression to a large extent meant, Hey, look, boobs, um, <laughs> you know, stuff we can't show, uh, I, not to in any way put down anything else that happened during that, you know, anything else we published during that time, but that was, you know, the sexuality is, is, is part of it. And it's still something that we want to explore. And it's still something that we see as trans. We're, we don't shy away from that. We certainly don't shy away from, not just, you know, LGBTQ issues, but just, you know, CIS, cis, you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, sexuality as well. Um, because what is interesting about the country is that 10 years ago, we were more progressive than we are now. We have re- really, I think, as a society in the last 10, 12 years, regressed, uh, certainly in the last four we have very heavily regressed into what we consider pornographic or not fit for children. Well, awesome. Give me that list of things so I can go do those things because that's yeah. where I want to be. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and that's why I gravitated towards humanoids back in the day when I, when I first discovered it is because it was a place where it was pushing boundaries yeah. and concepts and politics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, when I, was growing up reading comics, you know, it's the, the shift from Spider-Man and Batman to picking up a copy of the ink Al was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a light year jump and it was, and it was, it was staggering. And it, it, like you said, it just explores so much, including, as you say, the political end of said, Jordorowski, Alejandro Jordorowski really does that in a way that I wish I had the facility to do. Mm, mm. Um, now, bef- you, 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 no, you go. Uh, well, I, I want to bring up also that one of the things that I've always admired about you is that you do have, like, it seems a sense of celebration for other creators, for the medium itself. And you have like a book coming out that's not humanoids, but it, you have the how to create comics, the Marvel way coming out next yes. year. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> What are you getting out of putting that out into the world? Uh, trying to, you know, extend that educational system that Stan Lee, you know, he wanted to keep that bridge going yeah. between reader yeah. and creator. I get two things. Out of it. The first one and the most important one is this is the kind of book that I wish I'd had when I was starting out. Hmm. So it's, it's, you know, it covers not just art, but writing, lettering, coloring, every part of the process of putting together comics to primer for all of that. So it's being able to pass that information along means a lot to me because as you say, it's about celebrating the medium. It's about making sure the medium thrives and there's nothing more exciting to me as a reader 
than seeing somebody do something with a form that I've never seen them do before. Mm. On, a, on another level, what I get out of it is you don't really realize how much you know until you have to teach it to other people. Mm. And you also don't realize how many of the tools in your toolbox are either old fashioned and outdated or just need cleaning up and sprucing up until you start to teach them to other people. And I found myself more than once putting down a piece of advice that I just had in my head forever. And then I would look at it and go, I'm not sure that's really relevant anymore. I'm not sure that really is the way we do things anymore. Um, I have a question about like going back to the crooked house idea. Like, yeah. Like if you were to look around your, the floor you live on in mm-hmm. the crooked house, like who would be there with you? Either like the characters oh. that have yeah. created you or he's pointing the, to Superman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the, yeah. or the other creatives that you've worked with or admired, like who, who is on your floor? Who's in your room in the crooked house? That- really great question i mean superman is probably the biggest thing on the floor uh Mm -hmm. the attachment i have to that character is is stronger than the attachment i have to most of my family um (laughs) but beyond that uh harlan ellison is also a huge figure for me um he harlan's specialty was and i think his his core audience was teenage boys because not because of the there was no juvenile aspect to what he was writing but there is an anger that is with you when you're a, when you're a teenager, you know, more so a teenage boy than a teenage girl, maybe or maybe not. But just, let's just say teenagers. There is an anger inside you that is inchoate, that doesn't have a form yet and doesn't have a voice yet. And it's struggling to find a voice. And Harlan was that voice. Absolutely. And Harlan was the original angry young man. And so his work was, you know, touched me and guided me in a way that was was very strong. Um, Julie Schwartz also, again, I've spoken to him about him before, but as my editor, you know, when I first started out in comics, very much on the, on the floor. Um, I mean, those are the, those are the, I mean, there's so many more, you ask me a question like that and immediately 300 names flood into my head, but those are the ones that immediately stand out to me. Oh man. Harlan Ellison, angry young man that definitely spoke to this guy, uh, growing yeah. up. Deathbird stories. Yeah. I mean, hit me like a brick. Yep. I mean, the nonfiction, I, 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 the nonfiction holds up for me better than the fiction, mm. although the fiction is great, mm. but it's just, uh, you know, another person I would put on the list and not necessarily, he's not a genre writer, but, um, actually two, I would put, uh, I would put William Goldman on the list as, as somebody who was on my, William Goldman is such a, you know, a screenwriter who's been around forever and is such a fundamental part of how I see structure. He wrote a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, which is, a great book for any young writer, whether or not you're working in film or not, because it's just so good about characterization, about plotting, about, you know, teaching you things. I learned so much from that book. Um, and then I, I, why am I blanking on, on the name picket fences? Um, Oh, David E. Kelly, David e. Kelly. That's why yeah. I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. That's another guy. Yeah. Because Again, not at, not genre, but as a writer, that's someone who taught me the value of surprise. That's one who taught me the value of the fact that in an ensemble cast, not everybody has to be good all the time. Mm. The beauty of his shows often was in an ensemble cast, every week it was somebody's different, it was somebody's turn to be the asshole. Mm. And it was always somebody different and it wasn't make them assholes. It just meant that somebody was driving that plot because they were doing something that wasn't something you would expect them to do or not something that necessarily was in sync with everybody else in the cast. Mm. And so that spoke to me as well. Oh man, you have just made our day because yeah. we're massive David Kelly fans. Massive and fans. Boston Legal is like yeah. one of the yeah. first things we ever connected with as a couple. As our, um, my wedding gift to Brad, I painted a portrait of William Shatner in the fl- flamingo suit. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> and it's hanging right right to my left. I'm looking at That's it right now. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my, big, my big regret is that only the first season of Picket Fences is on DVD. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Lisa hasn't seen it. I and, haven't. And that's the reason is because... 
we can't it, really get it. Yeah, but yeah, it's so the, you get the box set. It's yeah. the first season. It's so good. All right, yeah, yeah, we should do it. We should do it. Uh, Mark, I guess we're going to let you go. We could talk to you forever uh, <laughs> about so many different things. Uh, super excited about this graphic novel. We loved it. Um, very excited about how to create comics the Marvel way coming out. Very excited about the ink call possibilities yeah. with Taika Waititi. Uh, for our listeners, um, we're going to have links in the show notes for everything. But if they wanted right. to continue the conversation with you, uh, where can they find you online? Uh, they can find me on, well, I used to say they could find me on Twitter, but Twitter exists to hate me. So <laughs> I don't spend much time there anymore. Uh, but, you know, I do have an Instagram. It's, you know, Wade Mark because some jerk took Mark Wade. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm on Facebook like everybody else, you know, who's over 50. Um, I, you know, I have my own webpage, markwade.com, which I don't, is, is not so much full of new stuff, but there's a lot of information there about creating not just comics, but stories in general. Mm. And I encourage young creators, creatives of any kind, working in whatever genre they want to work with or medium they want to work with to visit that because I think there's some good advice there. And I would just encourage everyone to go to Humanoids and check out some Humanoids comics. Go buy a Humanoid book and buy the Incal if yeah. you haven't you done so yet. Yeah. Um, so Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much. And done. Um, the, I, I had a listener who hey, hey. apparently, oh yeah, there she is. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> we have a, a, a friend who wanted to ask, did you go to Hueytown High? Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. I did okay. not. I went to, I lived in Hueytown when I was a younger kid, but didn't I go, although my dad did. So. Okay. All right. All right. Cause and our listener's had, mom went there and she was like, did, did I go to school with Mark Wade? Like, I'll ask <laughs> you, him. Yeah. She may have gone. I mean, depending upon her age, she may have gone with my dad because, okay. and, and the thing is we, at the, at the age, at the very, and then high school, at my age in high school and his age in high school, we were identical. It was, it's kind of creepy in that way. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, I, I will relay the information. Thank you for answering. And Mark, again, this is great. Uh, we will get the interview up and running in time for the release next week, right? Is it next week? I, I think, I think the week after, I think the Weekend. 23rd, okay. I think is the week. So, all right. Okay, great. So we'll have it for probably then next week leading into that release. Terrific. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Real pleasure. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. You do. Bye-bye. There you go. Our chat with Mark Wade, publisher of Humanoids. This really makes me want to delve deeper into Humanoids books. What are oh, they yeah. putting out right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like we, they are a space that is unique from what other publishers are doing. Like they're not doing what Image is doing. They're certainly not doing what DC and Marvel are doing. Their sensibilities are rooted in Europe. And, you know, what you get out of these comics is a political anger that I am so in need of right now. It just reminds me of our conversation with Sebastian Gurner from TKO Books that, like, a publisher's job is to curate. Mm, yeah. And this idea of, like, honing a voice. Like, we can't be one of the big two, but that doesn't mean that we don't have something to say. Yeah, and also maybe we don't want to be one of the big two, right? These smaller publishers are not looking for four-quadrant right. coverage. They're saying, okay, we are going to find our niche and we are going to drill down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, that is going to do it. You know, I think we also did a pretty good job not um, letting our geekdom explode <laughs> all over Mark Wade. Gross, I know, <laughs> but that was a genuine fear. It was not a co an entire conversation of us buttering his bread. Yeah, but like the thing is, like we've been reading Mark Wade for a very long time, and in fact, you know, we were just reading Sandman number eleven for our Patreon page, and in that discussion, we were using the actual physical copy of Sandman number eleven, and at the start of that comic, there is this little column called like chatting with Johnny DC. No and, published for Sosorial? Yeah, I know you really enjoyed that uh, Jeanette Kahn <laughs> column, but uh, they axed it after issue what was that, 7 of Sandman? 8 of Sandman? But anyway, like in the Johnny DC bit, they're talking about the 1989 Comic Con with all 15,000 attendees. Ooh. Ooh. 
Uh, and and in that, there is like this bit where they're talking about Mark Wade being a judge at a costume contest. And actually, at the costume contest, he awarded uh, three cosplayers of Black Canary, Shadow, and Green Arrow the top prize. How fun. Very cool. But like, it's th- that just... Well, that's a long way of saying that Mark Waite has been in our comic book lives for a very long time. And to finally be able to sit down with him, zoom to zoom and discuss science fiction. Like, I mean, this is a pinch me moment for comic book couples counseling. It's a big deal. And we're just so grateful to you guys for coming along this journey with us. It would not be the same without you. Yeah. And I hope you got a lot out of this chat and please let us know, tweet at us at CBCC podcast, email us comic book couples counseling at gmail.com. I want to know what you've been thinking about these last two creator corners. Who's in, who's in your room in the crooked house? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that, like podcast wise, like who's on the floor floor with comic book couples counseling. I'm still working out the details, not ready to share, uh, but it is something that I think about. Yeah, yeah. I think that I know they're not science fiction, but the monkeys are definitely in my crooked house. (laughs) You're hanging out with the monkeys for sure. Uh, But that is going to do it for us this week. Next week, we will be back. And yes, we will be closing out our conversation on Green Arrow and Black Canary. For realsies this time. With their wedding special. Plus, all 14 issues of their Judd Winnick series, which is wild. So fun. (laughs) So much fun and a great way to say goodbye to these two for now. And then on Thanksgiving, like we mentioned at the start, we guessed it on 10 cent takes and we are talking the Image Comics Valiant crossover mega event Deathmate. And that is going to tie into our next couple for the podcast. But again, I'm not ready to tell you. I'm not ready to tell you, but it might have something to do with image. It might have something to do with Valiant. And that's weird. Oh, did you say Valiant, Brad? Uh, don't mock me Can in my voice. Can we voices. read something into that intonation, Brad? Uh, I like doing voices. <laughs> okay, Brad. Yes. The house party in uh, in the crooked house. It's over? It's, we're, it's And Slimer has slimed all over Everything. I'm going to have to get a steam cleaner. I mean, in that's here. better than me geeking out all over <laughs> Mark Wade. I take. I'll take Slimer. Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you, Brad? Uh, you can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at a cool hand fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube. I feel like I've stopped articulating. No, keep Google going. And Apple Podcasts. Google no and Apple Podcasts. That's right. If you'd like to get exclusive, mm-hmm. you can join our Patreon where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com. Again, Jeffrey Brown interview, as well as a Mark Wade interview. What, what, what? Or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an act of service... Why not write a review of the show while you're there? We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts (laughs) and helps the pod. (laughs) We're not doing that over at all. I am so hungry. Let's get out of here. Friends, until next time, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. You're mean. (laughs)